Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Good, good. Well, uh, welcome. It's a privilege for me to be here tonight and discuss with you uh, a little presentation I have to give about the weather of the Channel Islands. And when I uh, came up with the concept for this presentation, I thought to myself, well, what are the influences of uh, the weather? Uh, what are the basic influences of the weather of the Channel Islands? And I thought, well, you've got the atmosphere and you've got the ocean, so that's a good place to start. So uh, I entitled it uh, Atmosphere in the Ocean, which is in charge. Um, now, if you want to make an argument for the ocean having the uh, most significant uh, contribution to our uh, Channel Islands weather, uh, well, you can, you can look at the following arguments. Ocean currents have a tremendous influence on local climate. That's very true. You've got the uh, northwest uh, current that comes down the west coast with uh, very cool uh, sea surface temperatures. And that contributes to the development of fog, which we see quite often, uh, especially during the uh, late spring, early summer in this uh, area. The El Nino condition also is another big factor. It's an oceanic influence, and it has a huge influence on the world climate. So um, there are your arguments for the ocean being in charge. But if you happen to prefer the arguments for the atmosphere being in charge, well, you can look at a couple of uh, factors at least. Uh, the jet stream, uh, which is a core of very strong upper-level winds that drive weather systems around the globe. Well, basically, think of the jet stream as a highway, if you will. It's a core of very strong winds that direct uh, weather systems uh, around the globe. Basically, depending on the exact weather pattern in the area, they'll either bypass you or come straight overhead and cause uh, inclement weather. You have unequal heating of the Earth from the sun and unequal heating of the earth and oceans, and that results in differences in uh, atmospheric pressure at the surface. You'll have surface high pressure systems and low pressure systems. This pressure difference, or as we call it in meteorology, gradient, uh, ultimately causes the low level winds. And I can think of two scenarios that affect us here in Southern California. Uh, the onshore flow, where we have high pressure over the ocean and low pressure over the land that you'll typically see in the summertime, which brings uh, winds onshore, cool marine air, keeps the fog right near the coast, occasionally pushes the fog inland. And then the opposite case, which you have in the early fall, of course, with the Santa Ana winds where you have high pressure over the Great Basin and you have lower pressure right along the coast. And that brings hot, dry winds from the deserts across our area and pushes the fog well out to sea. Now, well, since I've been mentioning fog a little bit, uh, why don't we discuss fog? What, what are the uh, causes of fog? How does fog actually occur along the West Coast and, and across the Channel Islands? Well, first of all, you have um, the northerly winds or northwest winds uh, represented by that red arrow. Uh, driving down the coast. That's a very typical wind pattern along the uh, uh, coastline, especially across uh, central California, uh, Santa Barbara County, down toward Point Conception. And that wind will actually drive the, sea, uh, the surface waters of the ocean away from the coastline. And as that happens, uh, the water has to be replaced from below. And uh, that's represented by this blue arrow uh, labeled upwelling. And this is basically the upwelling effect. The, re the wind blows the uh, surface waters away and draws up waters from deeper depths. And as a result, uh, you have a uh, uh, much cooler waters coming to the surface. You have cooler sea surface temperatures. <sighs> And you need a contrast in temperatures in order to get clouds to form. So this is the first ingredient, basically causing, uh, the, of course, the, the cool sea surface temperatures influence the uh, temperature of the air right near the ocean, make it, it quite cool. And that's our first <coughs> ingredient for the formation of fog. Now, um, 
you can see a result. Uh, basically, this is a fairly common example of sea surface temperatures resulting from upwelling along the west coast. And with my fancy pointer here, I'll point out the uh, coolest areas right along the coast here. This is uh, off Monterey Bay and then off of uh, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara County, uh, right near Point Conception. Quite cool there. And uh, it, in this particular picture, it is quite a bit warmer away from, uh, inside the, uh, the California Bight there, further to our south. Anyways, um, that's a good uh, dramatization or representation of uh, exactly how cool the temperatures are. That's what, uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius or about 50 degrees. Not too pleasant to swim in unless you have a, uh, a uh, wetsuit, that's for sure. Now, uh, this is a little graphic that shows you a couple of things. Um, and uh, this is how the fog first forms. Now, typically we'll have an offshore flow for a while, a Santa Ana wind, and that will blow, blow some of the pollutants that have formed over the land because of industrialization, cars, uh, exhaust, the uh, pollutants and uh, also sea salt that's present uh, in the air uh, above the ocean, these are all uh, serving as condensation nuclei. That's what we call them, condensation nuclei. Basically, they're particles, uh, small particles on which uh, moisture can form and collect. And when you have the cooler air, air near the ocean getting mixed upward by turbulence, and the moisture condensing on small particles in the air, coming into contact with much warmer air above what we call this inversion. Uh, let me point that out right here. You can see the inversion rises with time. The turbulence pushes up the moisture and, um, and the cooler air comes into contact with the warmer air above it and you have a contrast in temperatures. There's your uh, that's the very formula that you need in order for the formation of fog. And um, this graphic up here is called a skew T diagram. We look at this every day at the Weather Service, uh, every day. And uh, the red line represents the temperature. Uh, basically, this is a radio sonde or balloon release. You hear about weather balloons going up and they're, they've got instrumentation that can measure the temperature the dew point temperature, the winds at each level in the atmosphere. And uh, down in the cooler marine air where there's a lot more moisture, you can see this profile of temperature very close to what we call the dew point temperature. The dew point temperature is the temperature which you have to cool the atmosphere to in order to bring it to saturation or 100% humidity. Now where you see these two lines almost coincident, you'll have very high humidity and you'll have uh, formation of clouds. So uh, if we see that uh, the uh, cool marine air extends upward to about this level, which basically is about 2,000 feet or so, then we know that the, well, we'll call it the marine layer, basically, and we'll say the marine layer is 2,000 feet deep. Now above that, uh, you'll see, um, if you notice the temperature uh, increases to the right, so it's cooling, it's a normal profile of temperature. As you go up in, in uh, altitude, uh, you'll get cooler temperatures as you would expect, but above, the inver uh, above um, that point, you'll see that the uh, temperature actually increases with height. And that represents what we call a temperature inversion. It's basically an inverted profile of temperature. That occurs because the cool air associated with the uh, ocean moisture stays down near the surface. Above that, you have a discontinuity in the atmosphere and you have much warmer air because as I, as I mentioned at this point, we're just talking about the formation of the fog uh, after there's been an offshore event where there's warmer air that's come from the Santa Ana winds. Anyways, um, this is what we call the inversion base. And this profile right here where it rises with height is our inversion. And that's what we refer to typically as the marine inversion. 
and that will give us the height of the clouds. Basically, the clouds will form right near the inversion base. And with time, the ship completely disappears as the fog forms and it becomes a hazard to shipping. And there's the beginning of our fog layer. Now, another influence on our fog. Um, oftentimes, we'll have the strong northwesterly winds coming down the central coast of California. And they'll blow uh, right around Point Conception here. And there are a lot of mountains right in southwestern Santa Barbara County. They act as a barrier. And when you have winds coming down and pushing up against a barrier, they can actually accelerate a bit. So this tends to be a very, very windy area right in through here, typically, right around Point Conception. Um, then as the winds come around Point Conception and encounter the Southern California Bight, this area here, then they spread out a little bit. And some of the winds actually make a complete circuit and rotate all the way back around and northward up along the coast here and actually form a complete uh, uh, rotation. That's what we call our eddy. So uh, that's uh, usually centered right around Catalina Island uh, about here. You can see in this particular picture, it looks like the eddy has drifted a little bit offshore, but this is actually representing the counterclockwise rotation that is caused as these st strong winds come down the coast and spread out and do a complete circuit. So our Catalina eddy um, has quite an effect on our marine layer. When you have counterclockwise rotation in the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere, in the northern hemisphere, uh, it will induce uh, upward motion. And it causes our marine layer to deepen and thicken. And uh, whereas the, atmosphere, whereas the uh, marine layer may have started out around 1,000 feet deep, with the influence of the eddy, we often have the marine layer extending upward to two or three, even 4,000 feet deep. And it makes it a lot easier for the marine air to push into the coastal areas, the valleys, all the way up against the coastal slopes in some cases. So the Catalina Eddy can cause a rapid deepening of the marine layer. Well, there's our result. Uh, this is the Anacapa Island, a good example of fog. And it's rather a formative stage. It doesn't look like it's a very thick layer at this point. So it's really hugging the ocean. This is the time when it's really quite a hazard to uh, shipping and uh, marine uh, customers. So uh, we watch these situations very closely and, and advise boaters and mariners accordingly. For example, too, um, every now and then we'll get uh, what we call a trough uh, that forms along the uh, west coast. Trough usually brings very inclement weather because uh, the temperature profile is such that you have uh, colder air in the uppermost portion of the atmosphere, and you have warmer air, relatively warmer air, down near the surface. This is what we call an unstable atmosphere. So this leads to the formation of thunderstorms because when the atmosphere is unstable and you have warmer air down below, warmer air is more buoyant, it tries to rise. Uh, colder air is more dense and it tries to descend. And so you have a conflict between these two air masses that causes uh, columns of warm, buoyant air to rise. As that warm, buoyant air encounters colder air aloft, it condenses and forms clouds. And sometimes when that process occurs, or often when that process occurs, you have a release of what they call latent heat. And that adds to the heat and buoyancy of that column, and it continues to rise. And sometimes these columns will extend all the way up to 20, 30, 40,000 feet. And basically what I'm describing, by a column of buoyant air that, that rises all the way up to 30 or 40,000 feet, that's basically a thunderstorm. It'll be the cauliflower-like clouds that have a great uh, vertical development. And uh, those are our thunderstorms. They can occur in our winter months. Um, and I will show you a, uh, an example. This was uh, from October of last year. And uh, well, OK, it's just a thunderstorm, not a big deal, right? Wrong. Um, <laughs> I looked at this uh, picture, and so did others in the office. And we noted some very interesting features about this particular 
a buoyant column of air or a thunderstorm. Um, if you notice that it's got a rounded appearance, almost like it's just a complete cylindrical column that extends all the way up, that suggested to me and to others in the office that there may have been some rotation or may have been some characteristics of uh, severe development with this particular storm. When a uh, thunderstorm rises very, very fast, sometimes the column of buoyant air will start to rotate in a uh, counterclockwise fashion. And uh, so we saw this rounded appearance to the uh, column of buoyant air and we thought, okay, this particular storm could be rotating. And uh, so we inspected the picture very closely and we noticed the uh, dark area of rain bands, nothing too spectacular here. But uh, then someone in the office looked more closely. And in the area, of the southwestern portion of the storm, there are two dark columns and they're very impossible to see at this particular scale. So I tried to zoom in on this picture a bit. And uh, that's maybe a little easier to see. Basically, the southwestern portion of the storm looks like it's back in here. And there's a little bit of a shadow right in the area of the cursor here, the, uh, the pointer. And that's a lowered base. And then beneath it, there's a dark column that extends all the way down to the ocean um, surface. Basically, what we have there is a water spout. And it was indeed a, a severe little storm with a water spout. There's another dark column right in this area that's a little bit harder to see. We think that may have been a second water spout. That does occur sometimes. You'll have multiple water spouts forming from the same storm. So an example of uh, another significant hazard to our boaters, this occurred, I think, uh, northeast of Catalina Island, uh, south of the Channel Islands in our uh, Southern California Bight uh, back in October. Uh, another example of our interesting Southern California weather. Uh, well, we've had some flooding from time to time. I, I can think of uh, a couple of years right off the top of my head when I probably worked as hard as I've ever worked. Uh, the El Nino year of 1997 and 98 was a very significant year. Most locations in Southern California received about 200% normal uh, rainfall. Um, and then there was also uh, January of 2005, which was not an El Nino year, but we had some significant storms that stalled over the area and produced very heavy rains. Well, this is an example of what happened in early 19, uh, I'm sorry, in December of 1997. Uh, brought torrential rains to the Channel Islands. A uh, storm occurred during the height of a record-breaking El Nino. And I'm going to get a little bit more in depth about El Nino, exactly what is El Nino and everything a little later in my discussion. But um, this is uh, Santa Cruz Island, um, Scorpion Canyon, basically. The National Park Service buildings here. You see a lot of mud and debris coming through here. And in through this area, I believe there were some outbuildings that were damaged. Um, when, we, when we received the reports of flooding on Santa Cruz Island, uh, it was described as a wall of water that came through. There were some campers out there uh, that had to scramble to safety very quickly. I don't think anyone lost their life, um, but it was really a very hairy situation there. and. Uh, that was interesting to us. Of course, you don't get any opportunity to talk to a lot of people who are out on Santa Cruz Island. There really aren't too many people out there except for some campers. Um, so we got a little verification on a uh, very significant uh, flooding event. And it really made us more aware of the hazards that exist out on Santa Cruz Island if it's subjected to very heavy rain. This is a picture of Scorpion Canyon, I'm sorry, Scorpion Valley on Santa Cruz Island. And I find it very interesting because you'll note that there are rather steep slopes on either side of this valley. Over here and over here and more steep slopes in the back there. And it just occurred to me that this is almost a bowl shape if you use your imagination. And if you do have very heavy rain falling on this area, it will all collect right into this valley and then come right down the canyon, 
right through the uh, the drainage area near the uh, National Park Service building and out to uh, the beach. So this is quite a uh, uh, interesting situation. Heavy rainfall events uh, have to be watched very closely for their effect on uh, Scorpion Valley. Now this was an, another heavy rainfall example that I mentioned uh, was uh, January 2005. I don't think I've ever worked longer hours. I worked 12 hours in a day. I got two days off and then I worked another 12 days in a row. Um, so there was 20, 24 out of 26 days I had to work because we had so much flooding that occurred with this uh, rainfall. We had a lot of storms that came down with uh, what we call a pineapple connection, a lot of tropical moisture coming up from Hawaii. And uh, the rain bands uh, stalled over our area and just kept bringing heavy rain uh, for many, many hours. This is a picture of the storm runoff. Uh, you don't often get a chance to see uh, how were well delineated uh, rivers in Southern California because many times the rivers don't have a great deal of water flowing through them but uh, because of all the flooding you can clearly see Ventura River right here you can see, clearly see the Santa Clara River running through here and, and out through Ventura and some of the other rivers as well uh, further south uh, it's interesting to note too that a lot of the mud and debris uh, that were um, in the uh, river basins uh, were pushed out to sea. This little dark spot right here in the middle of all this mud and debris is Anacapa Island. <laughs> it was completely surrounded by uh, mud and debris from the uh, flow of the rivers. And of course, this is Santa Cruz Island right here. So that's a, a rather dramatic uh, <clears throat> example. Yes? Is that Right here? Believe those are clouds. I do not believe that would be snow. It is a strange, it would be a very strange place for snow indeed. So I would say those are probably clouds. <clears throat> so a very dramatic picture of uh, what was happening there. Now I just have some pictures of uh, the area. I was. Uh, <clears throat> collecting pictures uh, in preparation for this talk, and I saw some rather beautiful uh, examples of uh, interesting weather occurring over the island. Uh, this is probably a, uh, a winter storm with uh, unstable air uh, producing showers, maybe isolated thunderstorms in the area. So this would be uh, when a, a cold trough was over the west coast. Uh, another example, the same kind of situation a very uh, strong storm cell off of Anacapa Island. Uh, this particular one, again, same kind of situation. It looks like a line of uh, showers, maybe a thunderstorm in there, causing some fairly heavy precipitation. Uh, and sometimes the weather over the Channel Islands is absolutely tranquil, gorgeous. That reminds me of the Mediterranean, if you will. It's nice to have such a precious resource right in our own backyard. It's beautiful. Well, go ahead and read this. I don't think it's uh, an accurate depiction of El Nino, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, but uh, sometimes we hear a lot of uh, coverage uh, about El Nino in the press. And uh, as a result, uh, we hear some truths and some untruths. and. We try to separate the two, but uh, this is going to be a little change of pace in my discussion. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about El Nino, exactly what El Nino is and what its influence can be. What is El Nino? Well, basically, El Nino is a sea surface temperature anomaly in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. Don't worry, I'll have pictures later, and pictures uh, tell a thousand words. So we're talking about a, an anomaly or an unusual uh, sea surface temperature in the area of the equatorial Pacific. Scientists have discovered a connection between warmer than normal sea surface temperatures and weather patterns across North America. It's been discovered that warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean near the equator uh, 
often produce normal, uh, above normal air temperatures and above normal rainfall for the Channel Islands during the winter months, and indeed for Southern California in general. This is an image of what the uh, sea surface temperature uh, and uh, temperature of the uh, ocean under the surface looks like under normal conditions. Basically, uh, in the western equatorial Pacific out near Indonesia and Australia, you have much warmer sea surface temperatures. And as you go further east along the equator toward South America, you'll have much cooler temperatures. This is a normal scenario. During an El Nino, uh, the trade winds that typically blow from east to west will cut off. And that will allow the warm sea surface temperatures that were in the western equatorial Pacific to push eastward. This produces a sea surface temperature anomaly in the eastern portion of the equatorial Pacific. This would represent what sea surface temperatures would look like during an El Nino. This is basically the, uh, the beast itself. Now, how do we measure all these uh, sea surface temperatures? Well, there's a lot of buoys uh, down in the equatorial Pacific. Uh, this is one example. And they can measure not only sea surface temperatures with, uh, I believe, this device here. Uh, this line is uh, attached probably to a sensor that's just under the surface of the ocean. Or if they want to measure the temperatures further down at greater depths, well, this uh, line is probably a lot longer, and they just uh, let the uh, sensor descend further. And they can get a, a good uh, analysis of the current state of uh, sea surface temperatures and determine whether or not um, we have a developing El Nino. Well, this graphic isn't quite working, unfortunately, but uh, I was probably too ambitious in my uh, uh, choice of uh, graphics, but that's okay. What I wanted to show you, uh, and if you have to, you have to use your imagination now. I know you've got an imagination. Uh, right across here, it would be completely red, uh, probably in the neighborhood of plus four or plus five degrees centigrade, right across the eastern portion of the equatorial Pacific. Now, what is shown in January of 97 was that the sea surface temperatures off of the west coast of North America, including around the Channel Islands, uh, was quite a bit above normal. Now this condition intensified as we got into August and September of 1997. And as I remember, uh, it was really interesting. We were trying to do our usual job of forecasting the fog and low clouds and when they would come in and, and what the temperatures would be. And when you're forecasting the low clouds and fog, sometimes you overlook the sea surface temperatures occasionally. And I do remember looking at the sea surface temperatures and noting that uh, they were really quite above normal. I remember seeing typical values of anywhere from 72 to 75 degrees. It was really quite remarkable. I, I used to work in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I lived in the, uh, um, along the east coast there, and typically the waters there are about 80 degrees because of the Gulf Stream. And I thought to myself, well, this is becoming a little bit unusual. Why are the sea surface temperatures getting so warm? And at the same time, because you didn't have that wonderful contrast of cool marine air near the cool uh, surface of the ocean and the warmer air above, you didn't have that wonderful mechanism that causes the fog. So we kept forecasting fog, and we never saw the fog because... Unfortunately, the mechanism was interrupted by these unusually warm sea surface temperatures. So um, I remember that the summer of uh, 1997 into the fall uh, was unusually fog-free and unusually mild at night because we didn't have the cooler uh, sea surface temperatures to contend with. And uh, so it was a very, very mild time indeed. Now, this is our current status of El Nino. Uh, this graphic is working, fortunately. And it's showing that uh, temperatures are cooling in the eastern equatorial Pacific. You may have heard uh, late last year 
uh, on the news, they were all excited. We were all excited, actually, noting that the uh, sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific were starting to warm up. And we were thinking, well, perhaps an El Nino was starting to take place. We knew it was a, a weak El Nino. The, the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly was not so great. However, we were watching it closely, and, and we have a, uh, a forecasting contest in the office where we try to guess how much rainfall we're going to get the entire year, and the winner gets a little trophy at the end of the season for accurately predicting the annual rainfall during a, a given winter period. Um, and we all went above normal, or a lot of us went above normal with our estimates. And then in early January and, and uh, up through uh, the current time, uh, El Nino pulled a reversal on us, and the sea surface temperatures started to cool. And indeed, if you look at the latest forecast from the Climate Prediction Center, uh, summarized, the sea surface temperature anomalies have decreased across the equatorial Pacific during the last 30 days, with the most recent pattern indicating still a weak, warm episode or El Nino condition. The typical atmospheric circulation features related to warm episodes have not developed over the tropical Pacific due to a lack of persistent clouds and precipitation over the anomalously warm waters of the central equatorial Pacific. In other words, usually we'll have almost a reversal in the typical um, configuration of sea surface temperatures when you have an El Nino condition. The eastern portion of the equatorial Pacific will be warmer than normal, and the western equatorial Pacific, which is typically very warm, will be cooler than normal. And that's often due to uh, persistent cloudiness that forms over the central and western equatorial Pacific. But there is no development of these persistent clouds in this case. And they, as a result of that, they knew that the effects of this event on circulation patterns at higher latitudes would and, and have been and would be minimal. So a majority of the statistical and coupled model forecasts indicate that sea surface temperature anomalies will continue to weaken during the next three months with a return to ENSO neutral conditions. In other words, no anomaly whatsoever. Sea surface temperatures across the equatorial Pacific will, are expected to return to normal. I know it's boring, but, um, and of course the, the, the news folks will be rather upset because there won't be much of a story if it's neutral. But that's what's expected to happen uh, during the period of March through May of this year. So, uh, getting back to my original question, well, uh, the atmosphere or the ocean, uh, which is indeed in charge? Well, this is my own uh, opinion after working here 10 years and, and uh, actually living near a coast most of my life. Uh, the ocean has an influence on our atmosphere and the atmosphere has an influence on our ocean. Neither one is in charge. Both have a vital role in shaping the weather of the Channel Islands. And there are my acknowledgments. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Now I'll be very happy to take uh, questions if anyone has a question. Let me go back to that. Right there. One that had the islands. Picture that showed the islands. Oh, okay, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> no, let's see. I, I, I think the one that showed the damage on Santa Cruz Island no, in a scorpion. Okay, I'll go forward then. Yeah, that one. Oh, that one. Oh, uh, okay. Is that taken from a satellite? Yes, I believe that is a satellite, yes. And uh, it, a very... Um, I think that was uh, NASA or JPL that, uh, that took that picture, I believe. Yeah, that was quite a remarkable event. Quite a remarkable event. A lot of mud and debris and other, well, unfortunately, maybe a few other pollutants and all of that. Completely surrounding 
Anna Kappa, you can barely see Anna Kappa Island. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes. Well, the delay basically is point conception because the winds are originating along the uh, west coast, on the western uh, Santa Barbara uh, coastline. And as I mentioned, uh, I'll go back to uh, the picture of the uh, uh, Catalina Eddy, if I can find that. Okay. Right there. Um, the winds are coming down here. As I mentioned, a lot of mountains in southwestern Santa Barbara County act as a barrier. And so it takes quite a while for the winds to actually round the, uh, the uh, Point Conception and make it into the western part of the Santa Barbara Channel. If you don't have the ideal conditions for an eddy to form like this, then typically what will happen is the winds will eventually round Point Conception and then blow from west to east right through the, uh, the Santa Barbara Channel in this area. And uh, it just takes a while. They'll, they'll originate out here. And as the land heats up in the afternoon and you get the formation of low pressure over land with the higher pressure over the ocean, um, the afternoon hours are the most favorable time for that pressure gradient to draw the winds into the East Center and Santa Barbara Channel and eventually across the entire channel and into Ventura and Channel Islands Harbor. So the afternoon hours, and just depending on how strong the uh, pressure gradient is that day. Yeah, it's, it's always amazing to me and sometimes hard to convince the you know, disappointed uh, visitors that are on, on the boat with island packers. Uh, it will be a beautiful day here, and they'll be told that the, the trip is canceled. It's too windy. And here in the harbor, there's no wind at all. It's right, right. And it's, yeah, it, it basically uh, has to travel that distance, and its uh, progress is, is definitely uh, correlated with uh, the strength of the pressure difference uh, for that particular day. Yes, in the back. Um, I experienced a lot of problems that way um, to go back to the and now I'm just trying to do the website. Uh-huh. And that's helped me a lot. That saved me a lot of time and trouble. Good, good. Right, the East Santa Barbara Channel buoy is probably quite helpful for that. You can see if the west winds have made it that far. Um, yes, right there. <laughs> I think that what we're talking about here is that typically you'll have a lot of fog and low clouds across the entire uh, coastal water area. And with the uh, Santa Barbara Channel being completely open with no, uh, uh, no barriers whatsoever uh, for allowing the fog to come through, that uh, the area around Ventura is a, a rather favorable area for the fog to come in. So I think that might be part of it. Um, you, you've got a few barriers here with the Channel Islands, and uh, oftentimes uh, this portion of the bite will clear at least for part of the day. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, sunnier, uh, typically, along this portion of the coastline. But uh, for some reason, the fog can really channel itself right through here, right through the East Santa Barbara Channel and uh, affect Ventura mainly. Yes? Uh, do I remember then that the uh, warmer waters off of South, uh, South America and the El Nino then affects the jet stream in North America? And didn't we end up with kind of an El Nino event in North America with the, all the rain and uh, weather up in Washington and, and Oregon, but actually being kind of dry again? 
Yeah, you know, the, uh, during the time that we had a, uh, a weak El Nino late last year, uh, we definitely noticed that uh, Washington State and, uh, like you say, Oregon, even portions of Northern California were getting hit fairly hard with a, a long plume of moisture that was uh, definitely reminiscent of the kind of plume of moisture that you would see affecting Southern California during a full-blown El Nino event. Um, so there may definitely have been a correlation. I noticed that myself when I thought, interesting, maybe a weak El Nino uh, can only suppress the uh, jet stream to a lower latitude to a limited extent, perhaps. It tends to uh, cause the jet stream to uh, set up across a lower latitude. And uh, as the storms move across at a lower latitude, if there's enough uh, tropical moisture um, moving northward from the, uh, the tropical uh, Pacific, there can be some sort of interaction in which the uh, storm actually draws a lot of that moisture up into its circulation and then deposits it over uh, the southern portion of the United States, including our area. Yes, in the back. Other than warmer, normal weather moving from water temperature, surface water moving from western to eastern, does the Nino stand for, the child stand for another acronym besides? No, uh, from what I understand, El Nino is, is definitely the Christ child. It was a name that was given by uh, fishermen in uh, so South America when El Nino's occurred, their fishing uh, uh, exploits were uh, interrupted by the uh, warmer than normal waters. And it usually appeared around the time of Christmas. And I think that's where it got uh, the name El Nino or the Christ Child. Yes? Why, why are we so cold and dry this year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed that uh, <laughs> that late last year, um, a lot of cold air was already pouring into the Great Basin over Nevada, uh, Idaho, uh, portions of Utah, uh, Montana. And uh, I thought to myself, it's interesting to see such cold temperatures already over that area because that uh, oftentimes will produce higher pressure, of course you have colder air which is more dense and uh, more pressurized so you'll have an area of high pressure forming over the uh, the Great Basin. That was occurring all the way back in, in September and October and then it just continued. And uh, November, December, even more and more cold air was pouring into those regions and I kept thinking to myself, we're never going to be able to get onshore flow and get any moisture into Southern California if this continues, we're just going to have these dry winds because of the pressure difference between the, uh, the Great Basin and Southern California coastal areas. So uh, I was a little bit concerned when I saw that happening. I was thinking this is not really going to be conducive to getting a lot of moisture into our atmosphere because what happens if you have a prolonged period of, of uh, Santa Ana winds drying out our atmosphere when a, f a storm finally does come down from the north or the west, it has to overcome all of the dry air that's currently in place. And so what will happen is it will start to rain, but the rain will evaporate before it makes it to the surface. And so it takes a lot more moisture from a, a, a much greater moisture source from a storm to overcome that dry air and finally get the rain to fall down at the surface. So that was uh, something that occurred to me that we might be in a, a moisture deficit uh, situation. And then, of course, I found it interesting, too, that this was a year when we had a, a really spectacular freeze that came down in, in early January because all that uh, cold air up in the Great Basin had pooled to such an extent that some of it uh, made it all the way down into Southern California and caused a lot of uh, damage to the crops. Um, and even when an El Nino occurred, I'm sorry, even when a, uh, a Santa Ana occurred, uh, which are typically warm winds, it really wasn't all that warm. A lot of those Santa Anas we had earlier this year were cold Santa Anas, very, very chilly. So just an, uh, an um, example of, of how you can uh, 
get very cold air into the Great Basin early in the year and it really tends to influence us. I think maybe that's one of the things that's contributed to such a dry year. Yes? i got a few questions on Santa Ana's. Now, you can forecast a few days ahead of time before they're going to blow, right? Right. We can see the, the, the higher pressures building over Nevada and the computer models. And um, how accurate can you forecast the strength of them usually? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, we look at a couple of things. We look at uh, pressure difference between uh, Los Angeles International and an airport in Daggett out in the desert. Uh, that is a uh, one pressure difference that we focus on. Another pressure difference we look at is between Los Angeles International and an airport out in Tonopah, which is in southwestern Nevada. That's another pressure difference that we focus on, and we find that we start to have winds strong enough to cause a wind advisory when the pressure difference to Tonopah is about 10 millibars. So that's our rule of thumb, if you will. If we see a, a pressure difference of around 10 millibars to Tonopah, then we start thinking, okay, well, we're going to have wind advisory. If it starts getting stronger and if we have uh, very strong winds in the atmosphere just above the surface, let's say at 5,000 feet above the surface, or 10,000 feet above the surface, that's just more fuel to the fire. And if that is in combination with a strong pressure gradient, then we'll start thinking, well, maybe we have enough for a high wind warning. And uh, so that's how we basically gauge how strong these Santa Ana winds are going to be. I, I usually, I, I'm a boater, so I'm concerned about going out to the islands. Uh, the winds are going to blow. Right. Uh, I haven't followed the NOAA weather forecast too much uh, on the, the radio, on the, on the internet. Oh, the internet. Much, but, uh -huh. uh, do you give on your forecast? Do you give expected uh, strength? Uh, strengths of the winds on, sure. on the east winds? Absolutely, and and not only over the coastal areas, uh, you know, the Ventura County, and over the landmass areas, but also we try to estimate the strength of the winds that will actually go beyond into the coastal waters. Uh, of course, Catalina uh, Island, the harbor, Avalon Harbor there, has quite a, uh, a problem if northeast winds make it all the way out there because that um, harbor has a northeast exposure. And if strong winds uh, blow all the way across the coastal waters out to Avalon Harbor, then uh, they'll get some wind waves and other waves that are driven, well, basically wind-driven wind waves that will uh, push right up onto the beach there and cause them quite a bit of trouble. Not to mention uh, potential damage to boats that are moored in the harbor there. Well, what, uh, what could I listen to to figure out how, how far offshore the winds are gonna uh, be strong? We have a product called the uh, Coastal Waters Forecast. And uh, that's released uh, every day, six hours, uh, a every six hours each day. And the coastal waters forecast will give you the wind speed and direction, as well as the expected uh, sea heights and swell heights, and any inclement weather that you might encounter. And that would be on our website under the marine section. And one more question while I got you. Okay. Uh, how can I tell if the south swell is going to hit the backside of Santa Cruz from the buoys? I can tell a north swell from the buoys, but I can't tell a south swell. Uh, there's a buoy uh, number zero four, uh, 46047, I believe it is. Uh, it's a buoy out um, off the coast of San Diego County, well out uh, beyond the islands, that has complete exposure to a south swell. And uh, there's also um, some websites that you can go to. The, the addresses of those websites fail me now, but... Uh, they can break down the swell into its components and indicate to you how much of the swell is actually coming from the south. And so there are websites that are probably linked to our webpage on the marine section that can give you that kind of information. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes.
to airports rather than using these very, very expensive elaborate. <laughs> Well, I'm surprised too. No, <laughs> no, actually, um, that's just a local rule of thumb. We not only use the uh, numerical models that are uh, so generously provided to us by the folks at Suitland, Maryland, um, to determine uh, general periods of concern as far as Santa Ana winds or any other type of uh, condition, but uh, you also have to integrate uh, the experience of uh, forecasters that have been in our office for 20 or 30 years who have uh, examined uh, patterns uh, for many, many, uh, or have seen many, many examples of different uh, types of weather patterns and have come up with these rules of thumb. Uh, and as a matter of fact, some of these rules of thumb are some of the best uh, predictors that we have for uh, dealing with uh, uh, inclement weather or different uh, uh, concerns that we have such as strong winds or or heavy rain so it's really a combination we, we use it all uh, as a meteorologist you have to be a bit of a detective and you have to put uh, all the different uh, elements together all the clues together and come up with uh, an overall scenario that uh, these local rules of thumb and current observations and numerical models all point to and you try to sort it out and come up with a reasonable scenario. Yes? Oftentimes you see these low pressure systems marching down the, the coast, northwest uh, winds and the rain and the, and the clouds, and they oftentimes peter up and swing east just about point conception. Now maybe that's just then maybe that's not true, but if it is true, is that a result of the, the eddy that's, that's pushing those, uh, those winds and those low pressures? Uh, well, basically, often what happens is if a storm comes from the northwest uh, and it has northwest winds with it and some clouds and precipitation as well, what will happen is it will have to go get past the transverse ranges, basically the west-east um, mountain ranges such as the Santa Inez, uh, the Ventura County Mountains, as well as the uh, Angeles Forest in Los Angeles County. Those are generally uh, mountain ranges that are oriented west to east. They have to go over those mountains and then come down the uh, south slopes of those mountains to get to us. And as the uh, moisture and rainfall and clouds come down the south facing slopes, if it's in northwest flow, when you're uh, inducing downward motions on all the moisture and clouds, it will often cause dissipation. And so what we really need is for a very powerful storm to dive all the way south off of our coast and induce low level southerly flow. If we get low level southerly flow, then you have orographic enhancement on the southern facing slopes of the mountains where you have plenty of moisture in place and then the winds drive that moisture up the south-facing slopes of the mountains and cause further lift and cause greater rainfall rates. And that's how you really get the, the most productive uh, rainfall amounts. Hmm? Are there any other questions? What's the forecast for this the remainder of the year? I have no idea. <laughs> Next question. How about tomorrow? Uh, I have no idea. Next question. No, I'm, I'm, actually, that was a joke. Uh, forecast for tomorrow would be uh, continued sunny and warmer. What? Sunny and warmer. How about the winds? Uh, it's actually going to start getting a little bit breezy. We're expecting an offshore event, uh, a little Santa Ana action. Uh, not too strong on Friday, but by Saturday morning it could, it could get quite gusty. Yes? Uh oh. People come on and they say they're the meteorologists. Do they take, like, uh, does NOAA give special courses to these television people or how do they get the earn that title of being called meteorologist? Yeah, basically, uh, some of them are meteorologists and some of them aren't. Uh, and basically, what a lot of the uh, television meteorologists will do is they'll attend a broadcast meteorology program out of uh, Mississippi State, I believe it is. And that gives them the essentials that they need in order to uh, successfully communicate 
uh, the weather conditions to the general public. Uh, and then furthermore, they can take additional courses and study um, for uh, tests that can be taken that will give them accreditation with the American Meteorological Society. And uh, if they get to that level, then they're definitely meteorologists. Uh-huh. Anything else? I guess not. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, good job. Thank good you. Job. That was very interesting. Yeah, good. good. Well, thank you so much. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. a lot to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank that, that was good. Thank you. Very much. I spent 26 years in the Dickinson. Thank you.